Amen. Before we begin formally, I want to lift up one final prayer, if it's all right with you. Today, we, um, we're sending out thank you letters to uh, family and friends of our church who work in the administration that have granted us great favor over these past eight years. And it just began to dawn on me um, how many people feel this transition in a very deep and intimate way that affects them career-wise, that affects their employment, People who feel like for the last eight years they've labored to make strides and progress that may be revoked, repealed, and removed at the drop of a dime. And the frustration of some of them was really made evident today as I had conversation with a member of our church uh, who's in an employment quandary trying to figure out what her next move is going to be, um, feeling that um, the transition has left her um, really heavy and may need to go back home and leave our church and leave this area. And I've was just made aware of how many people are affected by this other than simply the president and his family. So I would that you bow with me. I want to pray uh, for those who are going through this transition in a different way, uh, that God would guide them in the, this difficult moment and decisions they must make. Lord, as we thank you for our outgoing administration and the grace and dignity of our president and his wife and family, we recognize that they did not serve alone that hundreds of people who looked like us left homes from various cities, transitioned here to D.C. and have served faithfully above and beyond what they were paid to do. That through them, great strides were made. Through them, this church was granted great favor. Because of them, Lord, we were granted access to things that allowed us to witness and experience the glory of this administration. And now many of them in this season of transition are searching and seeking for your will for the next move in their life. Some are facing some rough financial decisions. Some, O oh Lord, are faced with transitions and moves back to home cities, many of whom have called Alpha Street Baptist Church their family of faith for these past eight years. Lord, I pray that you would guide them. I pray, O oh Lord, that your favor would open doors that no man can close. I pray, O oh God, that their time and tenure here in this area has granted them a skill set and a knowledge that will give a gift that you use to open doors for them in the presence of greatness. Lord, I pray that if they must make transitions, that you would be with them and they would be peaceful and smooth. And Lord, that they would continue to have their faith rooted in you. Lord, we will miss some who leave this church family, but we pray that the same God they worshiped at Alfred Street will be with them wherever they call home next. God, we thank you for their labor. We thank you for their hours. We thank you, O oh God, for their service to this community, to our nation, and even this church family. Lord, if I could, I would name them all right now. But you know those women and men that you use to do great things in this land and for this church. And Lord, for that, we say thank you. Be with them now as they make this time of transition. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. A family of faith is that which shares the joy and the love of God. So do me a favor to get started. Why don't you find about five folk, not just the folk you're sitting next to, you already know them. Find somebody else two rows behind you across the aisle to share the joy, the peace, and the love of God with as we get ready for Bible study tonight.
right. Good evening, everyone. I am uh, excited to be with you tonight as we continue on in our study. Um, it's been a long day. Anybody else had a long day? Anybody else had a long day? Well, thanks be to God for y'all pressing your way through uh, to be in Bible study on tonight. I welcome each and every one of you. We welcome our family and friends watching around the World Wide Web. And also want to say a very special welcome to anybody who may be with us for the very first time. If this is your first Tuesday, we welcome you with great joy. We want to celebrate you. I'm going to ask if you're not embarrassed or ashamed, if you just raise a hand if this is your first Tuesday. Any first-timers with us, would you help me bless God for first-timers? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I want to give an opening comment. Uh, for those that are just joining us for the first time, we are in the midst of an intense and deep Bible study on the process of reading, studying, and understanding the Bible, and it's led us uh, to this midpoint where we are about dealing with the history of canonization. And in a moment, you'll learn some terms that you may not be familiar with, but we're basically looking at how the Bible came to be. How did these writings of various authors ultimately come to be shaped and formed in the 66 books of the Bible uh, that sit before you tonight? Uh, from here tonight, my goal is to get us through um, a little bit of a journey of history, looking at some of the issues that shaped book selection that we kind of talked about it and I'll review in just a moment. Uh, we're going to take a particular look at the difference between the Protestant and the Catholic Bible tonight, why those look different. Um, and then ultimately on next week, Dr. Judy is coming and she's going to talk about translations and paraphrases because after we get through this, we can now begin to look at the different translations that exist. King James, New King James, New Revised Standard, New International, and talk a little bit about the history of some of those translations so that ultimately you have a real a knowledgeable tool set of what kind of Bible you have, uh, where did it come from, and then ultimately how are you going to read it. So that's the direction we're moving in and we do have um, a large volume of work to get through tonight. Now that being said, I want to remind you that previous lessons are available online in terms of the PowerPoint presentations, and anything I share with you tonight is also going to be online, so you can definitely pull those up. Um, don't feel that you've got to keep up or write down everything, but the more you uh, stay connected uh, tonight, the easier it's going to be. How many people were here on Saturday for Bible study? How many people came for Saturday? Now, real quick, didn't you feel, didn't you feel like you were prepared for Bible study? Like She was using terms that y'all understood. You knew what a deuterocanonical book was. You know what the canon is. You know what she was talking about, how books are selected. It was, it was just great how the Lord pulled that together. And she and I did not formulate that. That was the Holy Spirit pulling things together, that what we studied on Tuesday showed up on Saturday. I do want to invite those who were not with us last Saturday. You don't want to miss this Saturday. We're continuing our discussion on the Bible and human sexuality, uh, preparing ourselves to begin looking at some of the specific texts that are used to define uh, sexual orientation within the Bible. Uh, this Saturday, uh, Dr. Bridgman is going to particularly look at why, out of all the commandments in Scripture, with the three th more than 31,000 verses, uh, that we limit ourselves to six when we begin talking about human sexuality. How is it that out of 630 commandments of law, we lift up two more than any other? Why is sexuality such a concern when we talk about morality and we talk about the church. And so I want to invite you to come on out this Saturday as we continue that ongoing discussion. So that being said, I want to do a quick review to kind of bring us up to speed uh, to where we were. It'll be helpful for those who were with us and an introduction to those who were not. Um, three terms that are very important when we study the Word of God and how the Bible came to be. We've talked about these uh, for some time now, and I want to make certain that you are really grounded in it. The most important is theonoustos. Everyone say it again, theonoustos. For those who are new to our Bible study, two things I don't apologize for. One is that we go deep. It's going to seem like you're in seminary as opposed to just regular Bible study where you read a verse, I read a verse, and we talk about what it means. That's not the way this Bible study works. Secondly, I like to give you big terms because one, you need to know uh, the seminary language. You need to know the exact terms. I believe that church ought to broaden your vocabulary. So I give you words, theonoustos. And then thirdly, it just makes you sound smart when you're talking to coworkers. Amen. So if you want to shut somebody down and they're talking about the Bible, well, actually, about theonoustos, you didn't got them already, you know. So uh, we learn big words. Theonoustos, God breathed. It is the doctrine that we believe that the Bible in its entirety, from the writing 
to the selection of books to our reading of it is inspired by God, that God directs that entire process. And unfortunately, the only thing God has to use to direct that process are flawed human hands. But we acknowledge that a perfect God is able to work through imperfect vessels to create a perfect product. So I'm gonna say that again, a perfect God is well able to work through imperfect vessels to create a perfect product. And the Bible is the production of God and God uses human hands, human writers, bishops who pray over decisions. And through that whole process, we believe that the Holy Spirit is able to lead, guide, and direct. So that what we have at the end of the day is a God-produced book filled with what God knows we need to know in order to live faithfully on this earth. Okay. Theonustos, it's all God-breathed. Another term that's important is delayed parousia. Everyone say delayed parousia. Delayed parousia is basically the concept that, that helps us understand why the New Testament writings are delayed in their writing because the, the original apostles believed Jesus would be back before they died. So there was no press to write the story of the life of Jesus because the witnesses of his life were still alive. But after the apostles began dying, or killed, excuse me, and we begin to see that Jesus has not come back then around 70 AD, you see the first attempt to begin to write the Gospels. And what do we believe is the first Gospel written? The first Gospel written was the Gospel of Mark. We believe Mark. Um, you can look up uh, Mark and priority when you get home or look back over former lessons about why we believe Mark was the first Gospel written. And we date Mark around 70 AD. All right? So Theonustos delayed Persia. Everyone say pseudepigraphy. Pseudepigraphy. Say it with me, pseudepigraphy. If you can't say it right, say it fast. Pseudepigraphy. All right. okay. um, that's why you read Old Testament Hebrew names. You just read them fast, and people think you're anointed. They think you know what you're saying. You know? uh, pseudepigraphy. Uh, we've talked about this, but I've never given you the, the formal terminology of it. Pseudepigraphy is when a writing is ascribed to a popular author who may not have written it. So this is what we talk about those Deuteropauline books when we recognize that some of Paul's letters weren't actually written by Paul, but were written by students of Paul who just said it was Paul. Pseudepigraphy, in the time the Bible was written, was literary and valid. It was a common practice. So in our world, we would look at that as saying something's wrong with that, that you can't write a letter and sign my name to it and say it's from me and I don't know anything about it. That that would, we would call that fraudulent, right? But in the days in which the Bible is written, pseudepigraphy is a common literary practice that is very common for students to write under the auspice and name and authority of their mentor. So we know that some of Paul's letters are written by other students of Paul and when we see that, we don't doubt the validity. We understand that pseudepigraphy is common practice. So whenever someone tries to hem you up and say, well, you know, 2 Timothy was written by Paul, I want you to knock him out and say, well, you know, pseudepigraphy was a common literary tool in that day. You know, because you, you can just shut that whole argument down, right? Uh, you shut that whole argument down, pseudepigraphy. The other one that we've been talking about is the term canon. Um, canon is how we refer to it is the list of the sacred books that serve as our rule of faith in Christian church and life. So when we say canon in this class, we particularly are speaking about the 66 books of the Bible, when we say canon. Now, we acknowledge that there are other writings that did not make it into the canon. And we refer to those books as either deuterocanonical or extra-canonical. Deutero meaning second canon, or extra meaning outside of. So when we talk about canon, 66. When we say deuterocanonical or extra canonical, we're talking about other writings that did not make the cut of the 66, okay? That's just review, we've gone over that before. You recall that the canonization of the Bible goes as follows, there's an event. The event is told orally among a community at some point, someone decides to write that down. That writing is then deemed to be sacred as scripture. 
and then those scriptures are correlated into the Bible. So once again, this, this we've gone over probably about four times, but I want to make sure you understand it. Jesus walks on water. Nobody writes it down the minute he writes on it. Jesus does not have a biographer following him around writing down what he does, right? The apostles witness it. The crowds witness it. They begin sharing it orally among themselves for years. Oh, did you hear about how Jesus walked on water? At some point, maybe a gospel writer says, you know what, we need to write that down. So Mark or Luke says, I'm going to sit down and write the traditions I know about Jesus. So he draws upon those oral stories and begins to write it down. At some point, a Christian community gets hold of Luke's writing and says there's something special about this. We need to keep it and preserve it. Okay? So we deem it as scripture. It's holy and sacred. Then further down the line, somebody takes Luke along with Paul's letters and says all of these ought to be shaped and set as our canon of scripture, which is now what we call the Bible. Okay? So that's the whole process. An event, it's talked about, it's written, that writing is deemed sacred, that writing is combined with other sacred writings to create what we have as the Bible. Okay? If you remember that, then you've got the whole process of canonization. You may not understand all the dating and who did what, but you understand how the Bible came to be. Okay? This is an important diagram. Very quickly, we, we were asking ourselves what we knew about the Bible um, by the beginning of the second century. So imagine you are living around one, about 100 A.D., okay? Jesus dies around 30, 33 A.D. Seventy years after the death of Jesus, here's what we know about Scripture. That the Hebrew Bible is canonized, meaning that there were uh, those 39 books of the Old Testament that were sacred to Israel that existed. That all three sections of that Hebrew Bible, Torah, which is law, Nevi'im, which are prophets, Kethuvim, which are the writings, they are appropriated by the Christian church. The Christian church, those early apostles, grabbed hold of that Old Testament and said, this is our scripture as well. We know that Paul's letters are being circulated beyond their intended audience. Last week we read, especially in Colossians, that Paul told the Colossians, read the letter I wrote to Laodicea and tell the Laodiceans to read the letter I wrote to you. And so we know that although Paul may have written to the church in Colossae, we know that the Corinthians read that letter. So we know that somehow or another that letter has been copied and sent to other Christian churches that are reading Paul's letters. At this time, we know that other gospel accounts have been written. It's not just Mark. It's not just Matthew. It's not just Luke. It's not just John. We know that there are other writings out there that attempt to describe and talk about the life of Jesus Christ. And we know that there are other letters that weren't written by Paul that are being circulated. So there's a whole lot of writing about Jesus Christ that is starting to take shape 70, 80, 90 years, within 100 years of the death of Jesus, we see all these writings begin to float around. Some of those writings did not make it into the Bible. We call them deuterocanonical. Um, some are extant, meaning that we have actual whole copies of it. So we, we have the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is extra canonical. It's deuterocanonical. It's not in our canon. It's not in your Bible, but there are copies of it. You can Google it and read it when you get home. The Gospel of Thomas, we have that. Some are in fragments, so we have bits and pieces, like the infancy Gospel of John. We only have bits and pieces of it. And then we know of some other writings because they were referenced in other writings. So in that Colossians passage, Paul makes mention of a letter written to Laodicea. Well, we don't have that letter, but we know it had to exist because it's referenced in the book of Colossians. Okay. There are some gospel um, writings out there about the life, the infancy of Jesus Christ. There are different acts, which are really his history books about the workings of the early church. There are different letters. There's some apocalypses. John is not the only apocalypse that we know exists. There are really over 200 deuterocanonical writings. There are over 200 of them, but only 27 made it into the New Testament. And so where we left off was, well, how do we choose those 27? If there are over 200, we're saying that literally less than 10% make it into the New Testament. What is the process that said this is in and this is out? 
Okay? If everyone understands that, then you understand where we are in Bible study. If there are over 200 and only 27 get in, why those 27 and why not the others? If you understand that question, raise your hand so I know you're with me. If you understand that. All right. By the beginning of the second century, we know that um, Paul's letters were deemed to be valuable for other churches. We know that churches began collecting Paul's letters. And so you remember in our timeline, Paul's letters come out before the Gospels. Paul's letters are written around uh, 35, 45 AD and begin circulating. The Gospels show up 70, 80, 90 AD. So before the Gospels come out, Paul's letters are being written and what we see in certain city churches is that they're holding on to them, that they're saying, you know what, let's keep all of Paul's letters. And if you understand that, then you see the first time an actual attempt is made to form a Bible. It may not have the Gospels, but somewhere the bishop or the leader of the church in Thessalonica said, let's keep all these letters. And so now there's a canon forming. There's somewhere a decision is being made to collect these letters of Paul because they're sacred to us. And that process of selecting them, you can see is one of the criteria. Did Paul write it? If Paul wrote it, we're going to keep it. And that's the first criterion used to decide which books are in and which books are out. As a matter of fact, when we talk about the Muratorian canon in a minute, you're going to see uh, Muratorian, but no, the Martian canon, you're going to see that Martian said anything that wasn't Paul shouldn't be kept in the Bible, right? That was his ultimate criteria. Because again, we're trying to ask the question, why the 27 and why not the other 173? Okay, 173 that didn't get in. However, no true canon existed by the middle of the first century, by, excuse me, by the middle of the second century. No true canon. No one had voted on it. There was nothing formal. Uh, what we see is just an informal process directed by the local churches. Canon is initially led to be selected by individuals who are religious leaders, and it's not until the fourth century that the church actually makes a vote on which books are in and which books are out. We talked about this. The first attempt to say this is Bible was formulated in 140 AD by a brother named Martian, okay, who is a religious leader in Rome. And Martian uh, only had 11 books um, in the Bible. He only had 11. Nine letters from Paul, one pastoral letter from Paul, and then the Gospel of Luke. And the reason he selects Luke over Mark or Matthew or any other is because Luke was a companion of Paul. And remember, for Martian, the only criteria is, did Paul write it? And if Paul wrote it, he says it ought to be Scripture. Okay. By the way, how many of you all heard Dr. Bridgman challenged our deification of Paul. Okay? And remember, that was our discussion on that Tuesday night, Terry. Uh, <laughs> we, had, we had that debate about who's more important to Christianity, Jesus or Paul. Um, and people about lost their religion when I asked that question. Um, but the, the point of the matter is that outside of Christ, God uses someone to spread the gospel and establish the church. And for the church, you could argue that Paul has been deified, that Paul is seen almost on semi-demi-God level, um, that we take everything Paul says as just being God's truth, um, because Paul plays such an important role in the history of Christianity. And Martian is evidence of that. He's a brother that says, listen, if it ain't Paul, it's not scripture. Okay. We talk a little bit about Gnosticism and the Gnostic Gospels, which you just need to know is that on the other end, whereas Martian only had 11 books in his New Testament, the Gnostics believed in a larger canon. We found that in the library of Nag Hammadi, and they had a Bible that contained over 40 books in the New Testament. And so obviously there are two extremes here, an 11 and a 40. So here's kind of where we were getting ready to leave off, that by the end of the second century, the church was faced with basically the critical question we just asked, which books should be in and which ones should not, okay, and why? Because now there are too many different Bibles out there. There are too many different uh, collections of holy writings. There um, are all these scriptures floating around, all these writings from different authors. So how do we determine which one? 
Well, what we see, there is a canon, a book discovered by Ludovico Moratori um, in 1740 called the Muratorian Canon. Say Muratorian. Muratorian Canon. The reason this is important is because it shares with us what books were accepted in the Roman church in the second century. So by 180, 190 AD, we know that in Rome, and we know Rome is gonna play an important role eventually in Christianity, right? It will become the center of the Christian universe. So a lot of attention is paid to Rome. And what Moratori discovered in 1740 was that in Rome, these were the books they read from and deemed holy. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, Paul's epistles, two of Paul's pastoral letters, two letters of John, the Apocalypse of John, and of Peter, so we see a different Apocalypse there, Peter, and the Book of Wisdom, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So we recognize that in Rome, around 180, 190, the Roman Christians looked at these works as being sacred scripture. Okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, Paul, uh, Letters of John, John's Apocalypse, which you know is Revelation, the Apocalypse of Peter, which ultimately doesn't make it, and the Book of Wisdom, which ultimately doesn't make it. Mm -hmm. These are the books they deemed holy. Now, I'm going to change my order of presentation for a moment. I need to fast forward through six slides, so I'm going to ask you to do me a favor so you don't see them. Everybody close your eyes. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, uh, you're cheating. I see you. I see you. I see you. Stop looking. All right. We're going to go back to those. Not only do we have the Muratorian canon, but in the early 4th century, there is a bishop by the name of Eusebius who is arguably, at that time, the most scholarly and versed historian of Christianity and the Bible, Eusebius. And so by the 4th century, so we're talking around the early 300s, the early 300s, he argues that there are three kind of writings in the church. The universally accepted writings of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, the Pauline letters, 1 John, 1 Peter, and Hebrews. By 300, those are universally accepted. You find them in most Christian churches being read. There are some that are disputed, but are still sometimes recognized. James, Jude, 2 Peter, and 2 and 3 John. And you'll remember that Dr. Bridgman on Saturday made a joke that if ever she were allowed to vote on Holy Scripture, she would take 2 Peter out, and she replaced it with letter from a Birmingham jail, right? which we're also going to talk about in a minute. Here's a little homework assignment for the studious among us. I want you to read 2 Peter. And the question I want to ask you is, why was 2 Peter so disputed? What is in 2 Peter that may have caused so much controversy? I mean, we can probably guess why people have problems with Revelation, right? Revelation has just always been a problematic book, right? People go to Revelation and get messed up. I mean, just, it, it, so it's better just, so, so many of us are like, let's just leave that out because there's nothing, nothing good comes out of the book of Revelation. You know, I'm just going to tell you what Revelation says. You ready? God wins. That's all you got to know. Just, you ain't, don't read all 20-some chapters and try to figure out who the Antichrist is. Just God wins, okay? That's the whole message of the book of Revelation. Uh, but I want you to read 2 Peter and ask yourself as you're reading, why would this book have been so controversial? What is in 2 Peter that early Christians may have debated and said, ah, we don't need that. That's not good. Read 2 Peter. Then he says, thirdly, that the category of those that are spurious, those that are doubted, those that may not be authentic. Um, the Acts of Paul. Remember I told you there are other Acts there was a book that was being read by some churches, but not all, called the Acts of Paul, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Apocalypse of Peter, um, the Gospel of Barnabas, the Gospel of Hebrews. Obviously, those are books that didn't make it in, right? Because hopefully none of you would, would identify, please know that those didn't make it in, right? The, all those, and, and, and number three, are not in your Bible. That's not the canon, okay? We know they existed, 
the church has read them, we have copies of them, but they were not, they didn't get in. Okay? And there's always been debate about revelation. So as we think about category three, the question comes up again. Why not? Why the 27? Why not the Acts of Paul? Why not the shepherd of Hermas? Why not Barnabas? Why did they not make it in? So, I got to back up a little bit. Close your eyes again. You're, not, you're cheating. You're cheating. Close your eyes. Ooh, I'm moving faster now. There we go. Well, this is what we know. By the end... Ooh, ooh I left out a slide. I should have... All right, we'll come back to it. By the end of the second century, scholars who look back at how these books were selected, how the canon was formed, the debates among Christians, there seem to be four criteria that are operative in the development of the New Testament Christian canon, four criteria that were used to look at a book and say, well, maybe not this one. Okay? Now, it wasn't that any official group got together and used these four but we can see as we read through the debates, as we see the writings of certain church leaders, we can identify that there were four criteria used. Okay? Once again, it's not like a group got together and said we're going to use these four and they voted. But we can see through the evolution of time over a two to three hundred year period that as we see books that made it and books that were edited or left out, we can see that those thoughts must have been guided by at least four criteria. So if you want to know why this book and not this book, there are four reasons that typically were used. You ready? Okay, let's go through them. Four criteria. The first, um, and I don't uh, give them one through four based on which had uh, greater significance. I just had to find a way to number them. One of the criteria was orthodoxy. Okay. Is the writing consistent with basic doctrine already recognized by the church. So as the church begins to grow after the death of Jesus and spreads out, and they begin to proclaim Christ and uh, talk about what is true doctrine, because one of the debates you're gonna see that begins to really shape the Christian church is what they deemed as orthodoxy and what they deemed as heresy. How many people are unfamiliar with either of those terms, orthodoxy or heresy? If I use those words, you want me to define them? Just wink, just wink. You ain't get raised. Okay, I see some winks. All right. Um, orthodoxy is what we ultimately believe was true, correct teaching. Heresy was what the church said is not good teaching. Okay? Heresy is stuff that was condemned. Um, heresy, one of the heresies of the early church was the belief that Jesus was not fully God. Okay? Um, docetism, that, that Jesus' flesh was just veiled appearance, he wasn't truly human, right? Because one of the first things the church wrestles with that, that comes out in the Council of Nicaea is what, who and what is Jesus? Is Jesus fully God, is Jesus fully human? Now, we take it for granted because we have inherited 2,000 years of solidified Christian teaching, so you believe what your great-grandmother believed, that your grandfather believed, that your mother believed that's been passed on. So for us, we've never debated it, but imagine the first church trying to figure out, what do we really say about this Jesus? Is this God, or is this, what, what is this? Who do we proclaim him to be? Okay? And where the church lands is called orthodoxy. What the church rejects is called heresy. So one of the criteria is, is what's in this writing, in this book, does it line up with what we believe? Believe about what? A, soteriology. Everyone say soteriology. Soteriology is basically salvation. Okay? It's the process of salvation. Does this book line up with what we practice and teach about what it means to be saved? Does it line up with what we teach about Christology? It ought to be simple, what we teach about Christ. One criteria that you may find interesting is the relationship of Christianity to Judaism. Does this book validate or discredit what the Christian church believed was their relationship to their Jewish ancestry? One of the reasons that's important is because the Roman Empire validated antiquity and was suspect of novelty. 
I'm gonna say it again. The Roman government valued antiquity and was suspect of novelty. So in Roman culture, the older something was, the more credible it was deemed to be. Romans were suspect of new ideas, right? New beginnings, new movements. So how does this movement that started in 33 with Jesus validate itself in the Roman eyes? Attaches itself to Judaism. And Judaism goes all the way back to Abraham. So now the Christians can argue we're not some Johnny come lately. We are the next evolution of what God was doing beginning in Abraham. And it grants them antiquity, which allows them to be seen as valid in the Roman Empire's eyes. And orthopraxis. If orthodoxy is correct believing, orthopraxis is correct doing. So one of the criteria seems to be, does this book and its writing, does it teach what we believe is correct Christian living? Right. Based upon what we see as the teaching of Jesus Christ. So the first criterion was orthodoxy. Is this, does this book line up with what we teach and what we believe? So when you read 2 Peter, I'm going to give you a hint. You ought to find some orthodoxy challenges, right? Some challenges to Christian believing that, that may have challenged why that book was debated. Read it with an understanding of, does this really line up with everything the church was teaching and preaching about Jesus? Number two, apostolicity. Say apostolicity. apostolicity. You got to break that one down. I, apostolicity, not apostolicity, all right? Okay, apostolicity. Say it again, apostolicity. apostolicity. Okay, apostolicity is a writing associated with an apostle, right? That one of the criteria they said was, look, the farther removed the writing was from the original apostles, the less credible it was deemed to be. So we, we trust it if we know it came from Paul or Paul's students. We, we, we give more benefit to stuff from Peter. But the further removed it was from the original apostles, it wasn't deemed credible because now it's being written by someone who wasn't an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. Now, if you get that, what gospel writer is challenging to us then? What gospel writer is a challenge? Luke. Luke was not an eyewitness. He tells you that in the beginning of his gospel. But who did Luke know that validated him? Paul. Luke and Paul were traveling companions. And so Luke's gospel is given credibility with the early church because Luke was connected to Paul in an intimate way. Remember, the farther removed you are from an apostle, the less we're received it is. So we know that Barnabas wrote a letter. Now, why would Barnabas' letter be, be cast out if we use apostolicity? Why, does Bar why is Barnabas cast out? Why, why does Barnabas not make it in? Well, first of all, who is Barnabas? Okay, okay. Paul's traveling companion, okay? Ooh, wee, it's tough. It's tough today, boy. It's tough. Who's Barnabas? Everybody say Paul's traveling companion, right? He hung out with Paul, right? Okay. Luke hung out with Paul. So why is Barnabas not in, but Luke is? Barnabas and Paul had a fight, right? Go way back to Acts 15. Barnabas and Paul fell out. And because Barnabas was persona non grata with Paul, guess what happens to his letter? He's out. It's not what you know, it's <laughs> who you know. Right? So apostolicity is a factor in how these things are being decided. You know, that the farther removed the writer is from the real Jesus, the less credible. Now, that's important. Because the question I want to ask you is, and make sure you, I'll make sure I slow down, make sure you understand this question. Is it possible for us to consider a writing sacred if it's not in the canon? So the question, the first thing to be asked is, what do we mean when we say something is sacred? What do, we, what, what do you mean if, if I asked you to say whether a writing was sacred? What, what comes to mind? What, what do you hear? Okay, yes, say it out loud, because so, I have to repeat it, because the people on the mic. What does it mean to be sacred? Divinely inspired. Divinely inspired. Okay. So by that criteria, 
is the letter from Birmingham jail sacred? Real quick, just, just flat out, yes or no. How many people would put the letter from a Birmingham jail as sacred writing? How many would not? How many of you don't even know what the letter from a Birmingham? <laughs> okay. um, j j just know that I believe as informed citizens, there are certain writings you should have read along your journey. Um, you can't be anti-Trump and have never read the letter from a Birmingham jail, right? Okay. You, 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 there are certain things you have to read. That, that, that's one of the most prolific writings in the world. So once again, how many people, by your definition of sacred, divinely inspired, would say the letter from Birmingham jail is sacred? Divinely inspired. How many people would not? It's not that's not sacred. I don't deal with it. It's a good read, but it ain't sacred. Okay. So what do you mean by sacred? Well, if I asked you what is sacred, what would you say? So I knew it. He said, did it make it into the canon? So now the definition of sacred is did the bishops vote on it? Because that's ultimately what you're defining as sacred if it's in Bible. So there's a difference between canon and sacred. For some of us, sacred and canon are synonymous. For others, it is not. Um, Kyle Stevenson, one of my sons in ministry, um, probably going to be one of the most prolific thinkers of this generation. Kyle will argue with you all day long that sacred is not limited to canon, that there are writings that are divinely inspired that move upon people's heart that are not necessarily that which was voted on in the fourth century AD, right? And that there are other writings that, that are deemed sacred. There are people who tell you some of Toni Morrison's work is divinely inspired, right? L literally, li you, you can't read Zora Neale Hurston and not encounter God, right? Like I would, I would put some of her works as sacred. I would put James Cone, Spirituality in the Blues as a sacred work. Black liberation theology, if you take out the vulgarity, is sacred to me, right? So the question I'm asking, and this, this is going to be really important for us, when we start talking about whether the canon should be closed or open, and if, if, if you can declare, oh, God, this is so deep. Lord, thank you. Give me a minute. If you can believe that sacred and canon are not necessarily the same. Okay, how many people can, would say that you probably, that's where you stand? Just in this intro lesson with five minutes in, you probably would say sacred and canon are not necessarily the same. Raise them high. If you believe that something can be sacred that's not in that 27 books. Okay. Okay. If it can be, the question you then have to wrestle with is, can God speak to you through that writing and reveal something that may be different than the canon? Of course, right? You say yes? No, no. It's, it's not about wood. This is about the possibility of something existing. Is it possible for you to read something you deem sacred and get a revelation or a knowledge or understanding of God that is different than what you read in canon? If you say yes, and I'm not, I'm not answering it for you, I just want to make sure you wrestle with the issue. If you say yes, then you're more liberal than you think. Because that is the liberal argument of like a United Church of Christ who says God is still speaking. Okay, that, that motto is deep, and The motto God is still speaking is their way of saying you can't limit the will of God to what you read in that book. Right? That God speaks outside of that that God spoke through Martin Luther King, that God speaks through Zora Neale Hurston, that God speaks through your pastor. Do you deem my, my sermon sacred? <laughs> of course, oh, too slow. <laughs> okay, now, so, but, but I want to make sure you see the struggle. So if you deem something sacred that's not in canon, you got to wrestle with, well, what do you do with what you receive? So what if I got up here and I start preaching, nobody's going to hell? Right? Nobody, there is no hell. Okay? That's the universalist thought. And that's common in Christianity. Read the biography of Carlton Pearson. Carlton Pearson went off in deep. There is no hell. Right? And if you deem that sacred, how do you deal with what's in canon? Right? That's too far, right? Okay, so for you, so maybe for you, canon does play a part of what's sacred because you can't hear sacred 
if it's contradictory to canon. Okay, he's too far. He's like, Pastor, that's too far. You're going too far now. It's something we're going to have to wrestle with. It is a major question. Okay? If sacred and canon are the same, or does canon shape what you define as sacred? Okay? And if so, that's why this lesson is so important, because at least you should understand where the canon came from then. God didn't just drop the 66 books down and say, this is it, right? Humans were involved in making those decisions that now shape what you believe you can hear about God. So you ought to know how it came to be. Right? If not, you're trusting in something you have, you're totally ignorant of to let you know what God is saying. Okay? Whoo, Jesus, get off this. Okay. <laughs> Another criteria is acceptance. By that we mean, was the writing being used by a lot of churches and cited by reliable bishops and theologians. So if we've got like the shepherd of Hermas and only that group over there is reading it, but the Corinthians rejected it, the Thessalonians rejected it, the Macedonians rejected it, then it probably is not going to make it in because it doesn't have enough universal acceptance. Does everyone understand that? Okay. The more widely read and quoted it was by theologians and bishops, the more likely it was to make it, which is why Paul gets in so easily, because the bishops favored Paul. If you think about it, most of the, when I, when I use the term bishop, I want to make sure you know what I mean. When I use the term bishop, I'm speaking, I'm using the terminology for the leader of a local congregation in a city. Okay? That's what I mean by bishop. Now, this also helps us understand Paul, because who appointed most of the first bishops? Paul, right? Paul sent Timothy to where he wanted him to be. Paul sent Silas to where he wanted him to be. Timothy chooses his successor. So if you follow it, Paul has a lot to do with how you wound up being a bishop. So you better vote on Paul, right? Okay. Well, I just want you to see the Pauline prejudice in this process. Was it accepted? And then finally, antiquity. Remember, the older the writing was, the closer it was considered to be to the historical Jesus. So we're not taking stuff that we know was written in 200 AD. So I can make it through. We talked about Eusebius. What I want to remind you is that if you look at the Muratorian and the Eusebian lists, you'll see that there was usually general consensus about most of the books and some fuzziness about others. Paul's letters, always consistent. Matthew, Mark, Luke, always consistent. Second Peter, eh. Hebrews, mm. Jude, Revelation, there's always some fuzziness. Some of those books that are in your Bible have been debated from day one. Okay? Maybe because of those four criteria. Yes, ma'am. So 1st and 2nd Peter have always been two separate works, and 1st Peter has usually been more generally accepted than 2nd Peter. Sometimes I believe that 2nd Peter was put in because it was attached to 1st Peter, that people saw them together, but they were always separate writings. Always, just like 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we know they're written at different time periods. Okay. Yes, Dean Howe. Paul's claim is all, so when you read Paul's letters, if you really want to see Paul angry, read Paul in 2 Corinthians when somebody questioned whether he was a true apostle. Right? Now, I know we've deified Paul, but I want to tell you something. If, if, if there's, a, there's a trend of Bible studies that incorporates psychology, and psychologists look at the character of certain individuals in the Bible based upon what is written, that's the only evidence we have. People tell you, Paul, Paul was a pain in the behind. Right? Paul, Paul's not nice. Paul's not easy. Paul is not quick to forgive. Paul has a bad temper. And if you want to get under his temper, question his, his apostolic calling. And he begins to tell you about his road to Damascus. He defends it vehemently. And you remember that part of that reason is because, remember, Paul was a persecutor of the church, 
then shows up in Jerusalem to my, hey, the Lord called me. Where's Peter? I'm trying to hang out with y'all. And Peter was like, oh, no, no, you know, no, 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 anybody but you. And P Peter and Paul never get along, right? So Paul's been challenged all the time. But what Paul does for the church in spreading Christianity validates his call more than any other. Paul does more for Christianity than Peter, right? And Peter was in the inner circle with Jesus. I'm not saying Peter's not relevant. I'm saying that for the spread of the church, you cannot diminish the work of Paul. Most of the churches, everything they knew and believed was what Paul told them. They weren't talking about the life of Jesus. They were talking about what it meant to live as a Christian. And Paul does that better than anyone else. Paul tells us what it means to live as a Christian. The gospel writers told the story of the life of Jesus. You very rarely talk, see Paul talking about any miracles Jesus performed. Read Paul's letters. He doesn't talk about feeding of the 5,000. They talk about walking on water. No reference to water being made to wine. But Paul has got a PhD in telling you what it means to walk in the light of the resurrected Jesus, especially if you read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. He's a deep theologian, and the church owes a lot of, mostly everything it believes, to what Paul developed as a theologian. So the next big movement um, in the development of the New Testament Bible is triggered by Constantine, right? Some people are familiar with that, that, that emperor, Constantine. He's the first emperor to openly convert to Christianity. Uh, we mentioned this last week. You got to remember the Edict of Milan in 313 um, really granted tolerance to Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. Now, I want to make sure, if you ever get a chance, you need to read the Edict of Milan, because there's some people who misinterpret that. The Edict of Milan did not make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. It made the Roman Empire tolerant. The same way the Declaration of Independence didn't give us equality. Right? Okay. Um, right. He called the Council of Nicaea in 325, forgive the typo there, and it was the first council of bishops, and Constantine, in a cliff note version, basically said, you've got to get some consensus on stuff. There are too many churches preaching too many different things, and the Roman Empire validates unity, okay? And that's where, we, remember, we talked about what the term Catholic means. The term Catholic means universal. So the formation of the Catholic Church begins in Nicaea when the emperor says, you all have to be universally on the same page. Okay? You can't have one church teaching something different about Jesus than another. So in order to make them all uniform, the Council of Nicaea starts. And the Council of Nicaea, basically the first issue they debate is who and what is Jesus Christ. Okay? And out of that council, as well out of many church councils, comes the Nicene Creed. Okay? Councils usually end in creeds or edicts. Uh, but the Nicene Creed. How many of you have ever heard of the Nicene Creed? Right? If you haven't, Google it, and you'll find out that you have. Um, you know it more than you think. So the reason this is important is because this is the first time outside of the first council in Jerusalem where Peter and Paul got together with the other apostles to talk about whether circumcision was necessary. This is the first time, so we're talking about 300 years after that, that, eh, not 300, 250 after that, that the church is called together, its leaders, and say you all need to start formalizing things. And you can see how this ultimately is going to lead to the necessity of formalizing what we deem as sacred scripture. The next big voice in the development is a brother you may have heard of named Athanasius. Everyone say Athanasius. Athanasius wrote a letter around Easter in 367 AD uh, where he affirmed the 27 books that are now in our New Testament. And he wrote in that letter, in these alone is the teaching of true religion proclaimed as good news. Let no one add to these or take anything from them. So it's one of the first formal statements being made by a bishop around the 27 that you have. So by 367 AD, the 27 that are in your New Testament were starting to be formalized. Okay. By 367. The next big voice is Augustine in 397, who also affirmed the Old Testament writings and the same 27 books. So Athanasius affirmed the 27, Augustine said the 27 and the 39 from the Hebrew Bible. Right? So it's starting to become even more formal. 
These are some big names in Christian history. The first official church pronouncement came through the Council of Hippo in 393 and then the Council of Carthage in 397. So that by 400 AD, the 27 books of our New Testament were recognized as sacred writings that should serve as our rule of faith. That's important. By 400 AD, really 397, the church had already said, these are the formal ones. This is not just Martian saying it. This is not just what Eusebius says. The official edict of the church by 397 was these 27 and those 39. Okay. Next big one is the Council of Trent, which doesn't happen until 1546. So we're talking from 400 AD to 1546, more than 1,000 years later. The Council of Trent is critical for understanding Catholic doctrine. I'm going to talk about it quickly in a minute. But the Council of Trent reaffirmed the 27 books, and the content of the Bible was made an article of faith for the first time. So in 1546 is the first time the church officially made a statement in faith that other Christians would now be forced to believe, right? The statement of faith that they iterated. And it said, if anyone does not receive these books in their entirety as sacred and canonical, let him be anathema or a condemned or a damned person. So it's not until 1546 that the church says officially in writing, this is what we need you to believe. Now, at the Council of Trent, we said that this is sacred. But it takes a thousand years later for the church to write it in the statement of faith. So in that we believe in God the Father, we believe that Jesus is, we believe, and we believe the Holy Scriptures. That doesn't show up till 1546, a thousand years later. Well, part of the reason this came out in 1546 was because in this century, the Catholic Church is going through some major challenges. That challenge is called the re, 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 finish it for me, the re, Reformation, right? Catholic Church being challenged, particularly by a brother named Martin Luther. Okay? Um, the 95 Thesis nailed to the door. Martin Luther is important because as one of the leaders of Protestantism, where you know the term Protestantism is rooted in the word protest because Protestantism was a protest against certain teachings of the Catholic Church. Protestants didn't call themselves Protestants. Who did? Catholics. You dang on Protestants. Okay. Okay. So when we identify ourselves as Protestants, we're, we're putting on a label that was given really in a derogatory term by the Catholic Church to suggest y'all are out of order. You, you Protestants. Mm -mm -mm. That's why I'm Pentecostal. All right. Um, Luther objected to any writing that didn't promote Jesus Christ. Luther challenged Hebrew, James, Jude, and Revelation. So when he's leading this movement, he's out there arguing those books, eh, maybe they shouldn't be in. So Luther reordered his New Testament and placed those books at the end. If you want to know why Hebrew, James, Jude, and Revelation are at the back of the Old New Testament, it's because they were challenged by Martin Luther. Didn't know that one, did you? We knew Paul's letters were ordered based on length, but the reason those are in the back is because Martin Luther challenged whether they belonged or not. He didn't really want to kick them out the Bible, but he said, let's just put them at the end and hope folks give up before they get there, right? <laughs> that, that after you read Paul, I ain't no need to read it, and I'm tired of reading, right? So he puts those in the back. Luther is the first one that raises this issue. If you ever hear canon within a canon, that's basically Luther saying some books are more worthy to be read and studied than other books. How many people believe that some books in the Bible are more important than others? Go ahead, put them up. It's all right. Okay. You're Lutheran. You believe in the canon within the canon. Right? That you believe that certain scriptures have greater weight. I personally don't. I believe that if we don't put a lot of weight in Ecclesiastes, it's because we haven't studied it enough and spent time with it long enough. But I put as much weight on Ecclesiastes as I do John 3.16, right? For me personally, I believe that all the word of God is important. Not that it's not important, all the word of God holds the same weight. Let me rephrase that. 
Huh? You in the book of Numbers, yep. All right, well, <laughs> see, man. Okay, you're not getting called on anymore tonight. Um, and he rejected the apocryphal books, which we're going to get to in just a moment. Real quick, um, those 27 books are affirmed through other confessions in the Protestant faith, the French Confession, the Belgic, the 39 Articles of the Church of England, which of course eventually becomes the Episcopal Church in our, in our variety, the Westminster Conf Confession, and then for us it's important, the London Baptist Confession in 1689 confirmed those same books, and that's at the heart of most Baptist faith. Let me see how far. We can do this, y'all. We can do this. So what happens in the Reformation is that the Christian Bible is now bifurcated, and you're going to get two versions, the Catholic and the Protestant. If you go to a Catholic church, the Bible they have there is different than the one you have. Right? Let me give you a quick reason in history why. Number one, the Protestant Reformation, Luther and other leaders protested against certain practices in the Catholic Church. Let me walk through them real quick. One, the selling of indulgences. The selling of indulgences was something the Catholic Church did to help. I, mean, I don't, I don't want to denigrate it. So here's the teaching of it, basically, Terry. Um, your brother dies. And your brother's in purgatory. right? And if you want to ha hasten his time in purgatory, you can make a substantial contribution to the church and buy an indulgence, which would then tell, which allow the church fathers to say your brother's now in heaven. Okay, okay. It's the, selling, it's the selling of indulgences. It's the way they raised money. Now, it, it offends our sensibilities, but you got to know you're talking about a time when people believe the church and the church leaders were the ones that made all the decisions, right? And they put all their faith in it. So if you said mama is in purgatory, I believed it because you're the holy man of God. Of course you said that. Right? And that's what you say, I believe it. And you tell me that if I buy an indulgence that mom will be released, of course I'm going to do it. And Martin Luther and the reformers absolutely protested against this. Absolutely. They believe in the priesthood of all believers. Okay? You've heard that term. That's basically the reformers saying you are as close to God as your priest is. Right? That you don't need anyone to pray for you. You can pray for yourself. Right? That you can do everything a priest can do on your own behalf. They challenge papal infallibility. Papal infallibility is at the core of Catholic doctrine. P Catholic doctrine of papal infallibility simply says this, the Pope is always right. The Pope is sacred. And what the Pope says has as much weight as canon. So there's nothing in the Bible that talks about, um, I'm, what's the term I'm looking for? There's nothing in the Bible that talks about birth control. But if the Pope says it's not the will of God for a Catholic woman to take birth control, a Catholic woman is not going to take birth control. Well, she's not supposed to. All right, all right, okay. Because the Pope's words are sacred, hold as much weight as Paul's letters. Right? So the reformers challenged whether the Pope was really infallible. Could the Pope do wrong? They challenged the veneration of saints, this whole praying to St. Mary, St. Thomas, St. Jude. They didn't believe that you prayed uh, to humans who died but lived a good life. And they absolutely believed in sola scriptura, which was the big key. They believed that only what should be believed in the church is what is written in the word of God. Okay. Kent. No, no, it doesn't. So, so I'm on different ends there. So they challenged those, but they believed in sola scriptura. So they would challenge the words of the Pope if they felt the words of the Pope didn't line up with what was in scripture. So at the core of the Protestant Reformation is this belief that the word of God shapes our doctrine, not a human saying things. And as a result, you're going to see the Reformation is the first time Christians are actually encouraged to read Bible. If you, if you look at some real Orthodox Catholics, they I'm not saying all. The majority of the Catholic Church does not read Bible. They don't have Bible study. 
on Tuesday night with a phenomenal young gifted preacher who uh, oh you gonna laugh my trans that's funny to you <laughs> sola scriptura scripture only scripture only that the only thing that should be taught believed is that which is in the Bible okay yes Before the Reformation, I can't tell you all Christians believe anything. Before the Reformation, I can tell you the, the Catholic Church proclaimed these things. And the Catholic Church still proclaims many of them, okay? which is some of the difference. You know? um, Catholicism ain't for everybody, and Protestantism ain't for everybody. Protestantism puts a lot of weight on you to understand what you believe. Catholicism, to me, is an easier walk of faith because I put my faith in that man being a direct... All right, so we're not going to get through. I'm going to have to leave it to Judy. Catholicism requires that I put a lot of faith in him as my, my religious leader and believe that somehow he's connected to the Pope, and I believe that the Pope is in the line of Petrine succession, that the Pope carries the authority of Peter to whom Jesus said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. So true Catholic faith also puts its faith in the authority Jesus gave Peter is now passed down to whoever the new Pope is that he has the same authority as Peter, and that's why we believe whatever he or she says, okay? A little bit harder. Um, no, I'm, I am, Lord, I'm gonna move. All right, so the Council of Trent is important because the Council of Trent was the counter-reformation. The Council of Trent is when the Catholic Church got together and started condemning what was coming out of Protestantism. And they addressed and codified Catholic doctrine on various issues including church liturgy. So in 1546, let me give you an example. In 1546, the Catholic Church said there's only one way mass ought to look, and it ought to be in Latin, and it stayed that way for almost 400 years because everything's got to be universal. Okay? Ain't no denominationalism. Ain't no what you think and feel. It's what we told you. Mass is one way. It's in Latin everywhere. Up until the 1940s, I mean, actually the 1970s, Latin mass was still in Latin even in the United States of America. And they began talking about the Bible, what the, Bible, the formal Bible is going to be of the Catholic Church, because Martin Luther's challenging too much. And so in 15, well, by 1563, the Vulgate became the official Catholic Church Bible. Everyone say Vulgate. That's where Judy's going to pick up. I had to get us there. Next week, Judy's going to tell you what the Vulgate is. Um, she's going to tell you how it's different than your Protestant Bible, and then she's going to start talking about translations. All right? Whew! Man, I'm so proud of y'all. We made, you know what we just did? We just made it through Christian history in a whole semester in one night. You just had a whole semester, and you don't have no tests, no paper, no midterm, no exam. Praise God. Woo, Jesus. All right. Let's go home. Let's go home, everybody. Let's stand and close in prayer. Please forgive me, I can't stick around for questions. Got to go pick my oldest up from basketball. So I'll be leaving out as soon as we give the benediction. As always, not only do we hold hands, but we name those who may be facing medical procedures this week, those under doctor's care, those who got some tests coming up. If anyone you know falls in that category, would you lift their name even now? Gloria Brown. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And that we don't fully exercise our faith until we engage our sound mind. I thank you, Lord, for the ability to stand with your sons and daughters in this place and increase the understanding of our sound mind. That as we wrestle with the real questions of our faith and our understanding, we do it not in ignorance, but with information, with truth, with historicity, with facts. Now, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us in that time of wrestle, reminding us that ultimately I don't have to think what you think and believe what you believe, my brother, my sister, but at least I'm wrestling with the real issues and I understand why I believe what I do. Now, Lord, I pray that an informed mind would be made manifest in 
a loving heart and a compassionate mouth. That all that we learn, we use in a way that is a benefit to your kingdom, to be a blessing to our brothers and sisters in and outside of the body of Christ. Thank you, O oh God, for the hand I hold. I'm glad you're here to study with me tonight. I want to see you next Tuesday, Lord, say the same. In Jesus' name, we pray, Lord, over those who've got sickness in their family, those who are under doctor's care, those who are in hospice, those who've got some medical procedures, those who are facing some tests. God, be present with them. Be their strength. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed and beautiful week, everybody.